So uh, my name is Luanne Freund and I'm director of the School of Library Archival and Information Studies, also known as the iSchool at UBC. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome those of you who are new to the school and uh, say hello to all of those who hang out here every day as well. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce today uh, Dr. James Lambe, uh, Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University. Uh, we have just met yesterday for the first time, I think, um, but so I went down a little path of six degrees of separation to see how we were connected, because everybody's connected in this, uh, in this field. And my closest connection is Leah Finlater, who uh, was my uh, desk buddy at IBM CAS in Toronto. Uh, more than a decade ago. We spent a lot of time uh, sitting beside each other and talking about research at that time. Uh, Professor Lende is a highly accomplished HCI scholar, a member of the SIGCHI Academy. Um, he, he works in areas of mobile and ubiquitous computing, user interface design tools, and technology to support behavioral change. And um, I could go on and on, but some of you uh, we're at the talk yesterday, and we don't have too much time, so I'm not going to say much more, except that as an information scientist, I couldn't resist uh, looking up the Google, your Google Scholar uh, stats, <laughs> and um, uh, kind of amazing, really, um, close to 300 publications. Um, don't more believe than 20... that. <laughs> That's garbage. I won't believe it. Okay, well, like... more than 200, let's yeah. say, for sure. Um, more than 20,000 citations, and an H index of 70. Now you don't meet someone with an age index of 70 every day. Uh, and so uh, uh, for, for that and other reasons, it's sort of pleasure to have you. Thank you. Welcome. I appreciate that kind of introduction. <laughs> so I mainly just think that means my beard is gray. Um, <laughs> um, hopefully prematurely. Um, so I'm going to talk about some both older work that I've done, um, starting actually back when I was at the University of Washington and running a research lab for Intel, mainly because I'm still working on some of those problems because I don't think industry solved them yet. And then I'll move from some of that uh, more traditional mobile wearable work to uh, more novel interaction techniques that we've been working on and then move off the body all together and talk about what I've done. But first I want to introduce kind of my research and teaching philosophy um, I come from a computer science department, but I'm always one of the people who's on the edge of, hey, do you really belong? You guys are really about people and psychology and these other things that I actually don't know all that much about. But I really feel like design is the key to creating um, products that are going to help people's lives and that they'll want to keep using. And so for me, finding that balance between the technical side that we have in computing and the design side as well as the social science um, is really important in how I look about the projects I do, but also in the teaching I try to give for undergraduates who are primarily in my courses, computer scientists, because they might not get much more than that. So I try to make sure we get some more design into the courses that we do. I also have an interest in cross-cultural uh, design. I spent two and a half years living in Beijing teaching at Tsinghua and visiting Microsoft Research, and so I have interests of how does design and interfaces um, impacted by the culture that you're trying to design for, both from a just practical perspective, you need to design differently to get people to um, understand things and use them, but also from an innovation perspective of, I believe, cross-cultural teams actually come up with more interesting ideas, often due to um, miscommunication and misunderstanding um, ideas kind of get generated that aren't uh, less expected. Um, I'm going to start off here with a brief subset of some maps that I like to show. These come from the U.S. Center for Disease Control and this shows the percentage of the population of each U.S. state shows the percentage that had a body mass index greater than 30. And what does that mean? Body mass index greater than 30 is considered clinically obese. And that's where we start to see correlations with a, a lot of different health uh, problems, particularly diabetes, but we also see issues with heart disease or even cancer. So you can see here in the US in 1990, most of the states 
had less than 10% of their population of BMI greater than 30, and then the rest were 10 to 15%. The ones that are in gray just meant that the CDC didn't have data on it at that point. Generally, if I animate this ahead year by year, you'll, you'll see what you expect, but I'm in the, uh, because of the time, I'm gonna skip every 10 years. You can see here that when we move to 2000, that this map has gotten a lot more orange. I like to say my friends in Colorado, with all those kind of Olympians and things in Boulder, you know, kind of keeping it green. But even by 2010, they can't really maintain. And we see 2010, a lot of states, especially in the South, you know, greater than 30, the CDC doesn't let you use this map after 2010 because they changed their whole methodology. But for me, they changed their colors too, which makes it impossible to show it to you. But essentially this trend pretty much continues or levels off. And the dispute in the public health communities are, have we leveled off yet or not? Um, you might say, is this just aging of the baby boomers? You know, some of us get up there in their 50s and start to put on some weight. We see these same trends with children. In fact, that was the first one they think maybe leveled off, five to eight year olds maybe leveled off. But right now, over a third of Americans um, by total population are clinically obese. So it's still, a really large problem. So one of the interesting research projects that I helped co-advise at the University of Washington, and it was also research coming out of the Intel Research Lab, was the um, Information School PhD dissertation of Sonny Consalvo. And Sonny had this great observation back in the mid-2000s, which was, hey, nobody's wearing watches anymore. Everyone keeps pulling their phone out all the time. In fact, we saw early research showed people pull their phone out of their pocket or their handbag 100 to 200 times per day. And so the question was, could we take advantage of those glances at your phone to change behavior in some behavior change area people wanted to commit to? So let's say somebody wanted to uh, do more exercise or be more sustainable in their transportation behaviors. Could we use that as a way to help them? So Sonny did a project called UB Fit. This was um, out of the Intel Research Lab that I directed from 2003 to 2006. The basic idea was, could we have people who had a wearable sensor that could automatically infer their physical activity, which today all of us have built into our phone, but at this point, 2003 to 2005, this was pretty high tech, so we built this Intel mobile sensing platform, which you see there, it's about the size of a pager, you'd wear it on your belt. It had its own ARM processor, memory, um, Bluetooth, and then it had a sensor board with about 10 different sensors. Essentially every sensor we could throw on there cheaply. Three kinds of accelerometers, three axis accelerometer, I mean parametric pressure, three kinds of light, etc. The late Gaetano Borriello kind of led the development of this and was really impactful for a lot of people in the research community. And then we did machine learning on this thing, you know, before machine learning was hip. You know, we were doing machine learning to say, could we tell what people were doing in the real world? That's what that did, it sent it over Bluetooth to the phone, and then from a UI perspective it was, what do we do with that information? What could we do to kind of help people meet their goals? So the way the UB Fit Garden there on the right worked is, as you engage in physical activity, let's say you ran for 30 minutes or more, one of those pinkish orange flowers would appear. Um, if you um, walked for 10 minutes or more, you'd have a sunflower appear, and if you did strength training or weightlifting, which you had to journal by hand, you would get one of those blue or white flowers. So the idea was every time you pull out your phone to do something else, to send a text, to check the time, to play a game, you might just see this on the background screen. You wouldn't look at it and go, oh, I've done three runs this week, six walks. It wasn't meant to be a quantitative um, interface. It was just meant to almost be unconscious. We'd call this an ambient display. So if towards the end of the week, you'd met your goal, this butterfly would appear, and you would feel good that, hey, I had done what I'd set out to do. If on the other hand, the display looks something like this, and it was Thursday, you might say, hey, you know what, even though it's raining out in Vancouver today, I'm gonna cycle to work. You better do that most days or you're not gonna get any exercise. Um, and, and that would encourage you to do more. So, we ran the study of this, and as the manager of this research lab, I spent a lot of money on building those devices that did activity inference, right? We built about 200 of them, eventually spread them out to the research community. Some of it was you know, doing the injection molding for the 
case and all of the building the boards, but some of it was also just dedicated engineering time to take AI papers that you could publish in the AI conference and actually make them work on a really embedded system and um, you know, the not be error prone. So to me, I was like, we gotta get this activity inference. It's a key feature, right? But you have to test this. So we did a field trial, which today seems like small, three months, 28 people. But in ubiquitous computing community, this is still like one of the bigger trials people had done with this kind of um, research quality hardware, et cetera. There are three conditions that are really important here. One is the full system, meaning people had this thing on their belt and they had that garden on the background of their phone. Another set of people had the garden, but they had no activity inference. They had to manually journal all their activities. Now we always had that interface because although this activity inference was great and we could tell whether you were uh, cycling, walking, running, uh, going up down stairs or a, a stairmaster, elliptical trainer, we couldn't tell if you were like rock climbing or salsa dancing. And I, although I put a lot of money into it, I wasn't gonna make it waterproof, so swimming we couldn't handle. So all those other things, you had to have an interface to be able to manually journal them and be able to correct the machine learning when it's wrong, which is going to happen. So everyone had that interface, but the second group only had that interface. They didn't have automatic. And then the third group had automatic, but they didn't have that garden display. They could only see their activities if they went into the app, which you journaled in, they could see what, they, what the system had for them, okay? That is most similar to how I think of many activity applications today. I have to go, hey, my fitness pal, what, am, what have I got? You know, I gotta consciously pull it, think what it is, or push the button on some device and say, hey, how many steps have I done? Versus the first two versions are ambient in that the display is always there every time you pull out your phone. So what did we find? Well, first of all, you'll understand here, we ran this study at what I thought was the worst time of year to run a fitness study. We had to start right before American Thanksgiving, so sometime in mid-November, and then it had to run through late January, early February in Seattle. So it's just like here. It gets dark, it gets wet, and other research shows people drop off on their exercise routines, also because of holidays which disrupt people. Um, it's hard. So it actually was a good time to run this study, which we didn't realize till later. Originally we were like, we, we can even wait till summer, this is bad. But the new director of the lab had taken over and said, I need my resources back, get this thing done. The guard participants, whether they had activity inference or not, maintained their exercise through the study and the people had to go in and look at an app to see their data dropped off like the prior research would show. So in some ways the ambient display I think is really a key feature for these types of behavior change applications. How do you help people who are less conscious of what their behavior is be more aware? And I think that's what it does. That is not to say you don't want the activity inference. If you ask people um, in both groups we did in the post eval whether they wanted that, people did. And in fact, I think as a study would be if it was longer term, it becomes more important. Anyone who's done Weight Watchers or any journaling of their uh, gym activity knows that it becomes hard to maintain the self journaling. We don't really know whether having some journaling is the key to maintaining it or not. We still don't really have a study testing that. We looked at the same idea in the environmental domain. So this was work um, that started with Pedja Klajna, um, who was also in the UW High School, who's now a professor at University of Michigan. Um, and then later taken up by John Freilich, who was a former student of mine who was at the University of Maryland and is now a professor at UW Computer Science. So we were wanting to know, could we use an ambient display to affect people's transportation behavior? So using the same kind of sensing, and in this case, some ESM methods, we had this interface on the phone. So as you engaged in green transit activities, this tree would grow its leaves and eventually these blossoms. And in this case, when we asked people, would you like to be more sustainable in your transit? How many people here would like to be more sustainable in their transit behaviors? Okay, this is like our surveys. We get like 75, 80%. Everyone would almost be like, wanna be more sustainable. But then when we did a study, we actually gave them a device that inferred when they did trips, which back at this time was hard to do because the devices didn't even have GPS in them. Um, and we noticed the trip, we did an ESM survey that popped up and said, hey, we noticed you just took a trip. Which modality did you take? Car, train, bike, walk, whatever. 
and then why, then you find being sustainable is like sixth or seventh on the list. More common is convenience, speed, money saved, do I get exercise, can I do work at the same time, um, uh, et cetera. So in this interface, we try to show the ones that correlate with being green. So if I carpool, maybe I save money. If I take the bus, maybe I save money. And depending who's on your bus, it's calmer and I can do more work, which is the little book icon there. If I walk, maybe I save money and I get exercise. So we try to show those together. And in this one, if you met your goal for the week, this uh, fruit would appear. So think of that like the butterfly in the um, UB fit example. And then after the week starts over, you start again like this. Now this one I did in collaboration with uh, Jen Mankoff, um, who at the time was a professor at CMU. She's now at UW CSE and uh, Tawana Dillahunt, who was her PhD student, who's now a professor at the University of Michigan. And their work at CMU said people might bond with animals more in this thing. So I actually designed this other one where we had a polar bear on a small piece of ice. And then the more green uh, activities you did, the ice grew and the polar bear got a mane. They eventually have bear cubs and you have fish and birds. And in this one, when you meet your goal, the northern lights appear, um, right? So we did this study, um, half, in, half the participants in Pittsburgh and half in Seattle. Um, I thought at this point, okay, the ambient display is really just to give you a, a sense of your information. It's not quantitative, but kind of what we saw in UBFIT. This study is more of a pilot study. We didn't really run a long-term big study. So take some of these results with a grain of salt. So it was only four weeks, 12 people, six in Seattle, six in Pittsburgh. I'd say the Seattle people were way more sustainable already than uh, Pittsburgh people. So it wasn't balanced in a great way. Um, it was interesting in that when we ran this, it was more like 2008. The iPhone had been out for a year, but we were still using these clunky Windows, uh, Windows uh, OS, Mobile OS 5 or whatever it was called. Um, and people still wanted to keep using this crappy thing, even though at the beginning of the study, people were like, I have to switch out my SIM card and use that phone. Like already a year or two into Android and iPhone, people had already seen how much better it was. We saw some behavior change. Again, I put that in quotes because in a month, it's, you don't know if it's changed, but we had people in Pittsburgh who said, oh yeah, I drive to my friend's house a mile away and now they were riding their bike or walking. The Seattle people, I think, were already green. I'm not even sure this is a good application idea because in my opinion, the only people who would ever run this are already green and you're preaching to the choir. You're not gonna have impact. What was really interesting from this study though was the qualitative results. In our post evaluations, we kept getting people saying things like, oh yeah, I rode my bike to work so I could see what happened next in the story. Mm -hmm. Or I walked because I wanted to get to the next level of the game. Or at work, people kept asking me, what's happening to your polar bear now? And we thought, what story, what game? We didn't design a story or game. It was just supposed to be a visualization. But people see story we're wired to tell and see and hear stories probably before any other kind of communication as humans. And there's a lot of research actually that people will look for it even when it's not there. Um, and so this really gave me the idea that we should actually design stories in these types of applications to drive longer term engagement. Because one of the big problems with fitness devices is abandonment. We know that after three months, a third of people will abandon their Fitbit after six months, 50%. And it's not because, hey, I met my goal, I'm in shape now, I don't need this and I can work without it. It's novelties worn off. Um, it may even be a reminder of what they're not doing, <laughs> right? Um, so people get rid of them. So can we use stories to engage this? So this idea started when I was on sabbatical in 2011 in China. Um, we never finished it there. And then at Stanford, we restarted with some undergraduates. This was their initial sketch for the story called Who is Zuki? It's like, who is Zuki? What is Zuki? Zuki's an alien who's landed on Earth because his planet or her planet has been overcome by runaway global warming. And he's going on these adventures collecting biodiversity on our planet to help re-green his planet. Well, you know, the FBI, the CIA is trying to catch him. Think ET. 
Um, so these are some initial sketches. Here is the idea each week as you go through this, if you meet your goal, whether it's fitness or sustainability, our app will support both, then you kind of move through that chapter of the story. And if you meet your goal, you get to the next chapter. So we've designed about 13 different chapters where Zuki is kind of going through this. Um, so you can see in one week, for example, when he's in this balloon, it actually should move across. At the top, these birds represent each activity that they engaged in. So if it was a fitness thing, like each run or walk might be a new bird. And then the altitude gauge is what percentage of your goal are you through? And the hard part of designing this today versus UB Fit 10 years ago is people's phones really look like this but with a ton of notifications blocking the screen. So how can I show you what I want to show you? So we've tried to push the salient information to the top and bottom on Android because that's the part that will not be blocked by those notifications. And then if you go into the app, you'll see it on, on your wallpaper. And then if you start the app itself, you'll see it there. And, and then it's a typical kind of fitness tracking app. But the research questions and this thing we've been developing for like a couple of years is now ready to do deployment. The biggest one for me is if I give you this app with this multiple 13 scenes versus one scene like UB Fit and UB Green that repeats, will people engage longer term or more often with the app? That's kind of the basic research question. Another one was I said, who's going to run a green app? People who are green. How do we get to the other 80% of the people? In the US, probably half of who don't think global warming is real. Um, and then the other half who are like me will fly off to China or New Japan on a whim without thinking, what is the impact of this? Um, so one idea is physical activity is a bigger draw for people, even though the health people will say it's still hard. It's not as hard as sustainability. What if we have a physical activity app that almost Trojan horses sustainability is just an extra add on. You get extra points if you also do green activities. Will that lead to more? pro-environmental behavior than a green app by itself. So that's another test we'll do um, second. Another one is many of these applications that try to nudge you in behaviors often just have one model of like what the changes you might make are. But these changes really depend um, on what are your barriers. So for example, maybe I need to drive every day because that's the only way to get my kid to the childcare they need to go to. So me continually saying stop driving doesn't help. So can you understand those things better? Another one is the feedback we use. You know, in these, let's say it's uh, UB Green, it's kind of like, oh, we're trying to get you to think about saving, you know, the polar ecosystem. Well, you know, maybe that works for Karen, but you know, I want to save money and he wants to compete with his friends. Often we just build this one app that just assumes some model, like, oh yeah, he's so competitive. Um, whereas that may not be what drives him. And so could we detect what the right value system is and have the interface adapt to kind of push on that best? And then cultural feedback. So I did a study in China with several hundred people in China and the US where we had them fill out a standard carbon calculator. And then we manipulated the feedback to be positive or negative feedback and had them commit to behavior changes and then later self-report which changes they have made. So the flaw of the study is we have no ground truth, it's all self-report and it's short term, like three weeks. So we don't really know what happened, but we did have a statistically significant difference in the Chinese population that the negative feedback led to more pro-environmental behavior change self-reported versus the Americans it being the opposite didn't have a statistical difference though in the Americans, but the Chinese population was definitely statistical. So now I want to run that kind of study where we actually have ground truth to know what behaviors really occurred, but that might say positive versus negative feedback may have different impact depending on the culture. And then finally, from a kind of ethics point of view, and I think this is really something we need to look at a lot more um, with kind of the rise of machine learning AI is, well, what kind of data are people even comfortable being tracked and who can see it and when? Um, we talk about it a lot, but we don't design interesting ways to think about these problems. And I think, you know, the Facebook scandal right now is only highlighting this more to people so that they're going to think about it more than they have, which has surprised me it's taken this long. So I'm kind of interested in 
pushing on that. Okay, any questions on that before I switch to wearables? And what's our time? What time do we end this? 11.59. We go till when? Yeah. Noon, okay. Okay, well, let me switch to this other domain. So um, I've been interested in how do we move away from just typical phone, uh, laptop UIs to interfaces and interactions that might use other parts of our body. So for example, your eyes or hands are busy or you're physically active. I've worked in um, um, speech recognition and voice interfaces, though not in a long time, though I have a new publication coming out there. But a few years ago, I was more interested in how might we do interesting things with wearables in these situations. And so the context of use really matters. This is a scene um, that one of my grad students was happy to recreate for me, but I see on the Stanford campus every day. I don't know what it's like at UBC, but here we got this guy on his phone, on his bike, <laughs> looking at his phone. Usually they're not wearing a helmet. Um, I, I think I see a, a, a bike accident at Stanford maybe every three weeks, um, literally, and my doctor friends tell me there's somebody whose jaw is being rewired in the emergency room every day, actually, at the Stanford Hospital. Um, and they're, you know, Kessler there had his helmet. They usually don't have a helmet. So one idea we had was, could we use vibration as a, a feedback mechanism to not have people looking at their phones? You know, whether it's in that situation or more pedestrian situations, for example, Maybe you're in this meeting here and you want to know, you know, what's the Canuck score and you do the right gesture here and vibrates back with the score for you on your arm. Um, so the input side of this was the PhD dissertation of Scott Saponis, jointly advised with Desney Tan and Microsoft Research. Um, Scott published his papers on this 2009, 2010 at Wiston Chi. This was in his envisionment. Could we build um, an armband that could detect the muscle firing uh, from the nerves of your fingers and then be able to um, use that as a good way of doing finger gestures for input. Scott was also supposed to do output using vibration, but you know, as these PhD dissertations often go, it got a little out of hand and he wanted to graduate. So we let him off uh, where he's now at Microsoft Research working with Desney. Um, so that was his envisionment. He first did a wired version. This was the second version. Wireless looks a little messy, but it's like a sweatband with a bunch of small circuit boards that had EMG sensors, electrodes, and sensing chips in it um, all around uh, the arm. And then you know he did studies of this, and we found that people, even in this really early version, without machine learning experts, we could get over 90% accuracy of doing things like pinches from different fingers, or holding the mug, or having a 10 kilogram bag and doing your fingers. So you imagine some of these cars where like you kick your leg under it to pop the trunk, maybe you just do it with your fingers um, or something like this. Um, so this worked pretty well. Um, now more recently we started to think, hey, let's get back to the output of this, you know, especially in this activity uh, context. Might you want to say, hey, while I'm biking, could I hit, notice, hey, you're 80% of the way towards your goal without me having to pull out my phone and look at it. Could I just feel that? Um, so Jessica Cochard, who is a postdoc working with me, she's now a um, professor at IDC Herleitza in Israel, um, wanted to look at, could we just do this with some of the off-the-shelf smartwatches? Um, so, you know, we took a commercial smartwatch that could just do essentially one amplitude of vibration and we really could just mess with the uh, frequency and how long the pulses were. So we did a lot of design work about trying to find really a language. And in this case, I was really skeptical about how much information we could communicate that way. So I really wanted to say, could we just do the numbers one to 10 and use that to say, hey, you're 10%, 20% towards some goal. I felt there were a lot of applications where I felt just having that kind of percent done number could be useful, number of emails or no, the score, I don't know what, just one to 10. So we worked on that and we eventually, after a few lab studies, came up with a, a language that I wanna say is inspired in some ways by Roman numerals. So a single short pulse is a one, two short pulses is a two, all the way to a four, and then five is one long pulse. And then we repeat for six, it's a long five plus a short one to get six 
all the way to nine and then 10 is two long pulses. That seemed to work really well compared to other ones we tried. We did an in-lab study where we quickly train people on it and then give them a bunch of random uh, pulses and see what they get. And we get over 98% in the lab. So it worked well in the lab study. What we really wanted to do is see, will this work in the wild while you're out doing um, your real life? So we ran a study that lasted almost 30 days with uh, 20, 25, 28 participants where about 10 to 12 times a day, we would send them a random number between one and 10. And then they sort of did an ESM survey on their watch. So they had, this was just using a commercial Pebble watch, which is now out of business, Rip Pebble. Um, so they would get the vibration and they could ignore it or they could answer, I'm busy, I can't do this right now. Or they could answer, I felt it and say what they thought the number was, how confident they were, and then what activity they were engaged in at the time. So this is kind of what it looked like. Here's um, Lydia Chilton, who's now a professor um, at Columbia, demoing this. So she might be working, she feels the vibration, she answers the study. Um, with this, we found better than 89% recognition in the wild um, in situ over four weeks. If you give a pre-signal, like a long signal saying a hey, vibration is coming, you can get slightly better, maybe 91%. Um, I think this is kind of a lower bound on what you would get because we're sending people random numbers. In most applications, it would be either an increasing or decreasing. And so if I had seen a three before, I know it's more than a three. And so it's not one or two. So I think we'd probably get better on this in a real application. Um, but it worked pretty well. Um, and we had people ranging from 18 to like 68 doing this study. So it even worked for older folks, which I was worried about. Um, so if you put these two together, you might imagine having a wristband that you could do input and having a wristband for output. In this case, we used um, um, a commercial device for the um, input that came out maybe two or three years after Scott did his PhD. Um, I think it's a spin out of Waterloo. Um, we assume they read our papers, but we have no direct knowledge of that. Um, so you can buy one of these kind of input devices for about $250 now. So here you might be running. She has one on each arm. It is called the Mayo armband and you might do a gesture and then get a different uh, vibration feedback, like how far have I gone or whatever. And here's a meeting. So that's how we might put those two together. We haven't actually built those applications. We did some quick demos of that. Um, the student who's working on that moved on to something else. Um, but some of the research questions uh, we have, for example, if we push a vibration, you know, so we notice you've done 20% of your step goal for the day and we just pushed you the number two, would that lead you to do more, uh, more exercise than if you had to push a button, like on a Fitbit or something, go, oh, I've done 2,000 steps. We ran a study of this. We haven't yet fully analyzed it. We don't see actually a difference in how much people exercise, but we actually see a difference in their mindset towards exercise. We found the people in the polling condition actually have a more negative view of exercise at the end of the study from the beginning of the study and folks who kind of have it pushed at them, um, maintain their mindset, okay? It may be that it's that the pushing and vibration might not matter here. It may just be that by pushing it, you're only showing them positive things. We only tell you about it when you've done something versus when you pull it and I go, oh my God, I've only done 200 more steps? I'm not really sure about that, but that could be the result. Another one we're working on, and this is with um, psychologist Aaliyah Crum. Um, who's really an expert in uh, mindset towards health um, and also placebo effects, is can we shape people's mindset by the types of messages that we're sending them? So right now, our simplest study is we're using the Apple Watch. We have a study where some folks, we've inflated their step count by 40%, and some folks, we deflated their step count by 40%, and then there's a control group where we don't touch it. And the theory is the people who we inflate it will actually walk more than they would have otherwise because they'll feel better about what they're doing. 
Um, I can tell you that the deflation condition definitely makes you do less. I've been in that condition for months and it's really demotivating. Um, but we're not, we don't have a study done yet. We're at pilot stage. Okay, so the next bit I wanted to talk about is off-body interaction. This project started with Luke Vink, who was a designer working with me at Cornell Tech in New York in uh, 2013. And at the time of this project, Google Glass was all the rage. Everyone was talking about, hey, we're gonna do this augmented reality and I'm gonna be in a bar and be able to talk to you with my glasses on. And some of us were just like, have you ever had a conversation with Thad Starner? Do you really think this is what you wanna do? But anyways, this was almost done as a dystopian alternative. Um, and then some people were interested in, so we actually built it. So um, oh, the way I do a lot of my research these days is you know we'll do need finding and field work that's one way another way is we'll do that and then we'll create a concept video um, that tries to tell the story and part of that is in writing the script itself and trying to shoot it we learn more about the idea but then after we create it we also have an artifact that we can get people to talk to us about whether it's experts or uh, potential end users this uh, autonomous wandering interface was of that sort and it was also because we thought it was so technically hard to build, we were like, let's just make a video first and see. Um, and in fact, we did the video in like two months and we took at least three years to build a subset of what is in the video. So note this is a concept video. The only thing real in this is the location, the actress, and the drone. Everything else you see, the interaction, the display is all after effects. Let me check the sound. Okay, we're good. So this is a shot in New York City at night, which is kind of nice if you're doing projector. In the real thing, it's really loud, and in New York, there's trash blowing around, but you don't see this in this video. So the idea was, could we, instead of wear glasses, project this interface around your body, and she's using gesture to interact with it, she selects a map and goes home. Not sure if she's lost. We wanted to not have anything on your body, so it's all from the drone itself. It might even be geekier to Google Glass. Yeah, it might be geekier. <laughs> I like this actually, the multi-user, which I didn't get till we made the movie. You don't have to register your glasses to be the same. You're seeing the same thing in the real world um, for that. We thought, oh, private information, you're gonna to have to like project onto the hand and make it small so that people don't see it. And if you had a gimbal on this, could you move the projection um, to different surfaces? So the ground versus this wall. That's actually probably pretty hard. We haven't actually tried to build that. In this scenario, maybe she's running with a friend who moved, who she used to run with, or maybe that's her run from last week that she's trying to keep up with. Now again, when we made this and we showed it, there are a, a bunch of people said, especially women said, oh, I'd like that just as a running companion when I run at night for people to know something's with me, don't mess with me, I've got my kind of drone guardian there, sees everything going on. So again, that was the vision video. We then took a step back to say, okay, what the heck would you actually use this for? Why do I want this? One scenario for us was tour guides. I don't know what it's like at UBC, but at Stanford, there's all these tourists who come to the campus checking it out. And until I moved to Stanford, I'd only seen this in China. If you go to Tsinghua or Beida, Peking University, in the summer, there's like a thousand people lined up at the gates. They even have like turnstile things like Disneyland to go tour the campus. Um, so at Stanford, there's like these tour groups of like 40 people. You can't hear the person, you can't ask questions. We thought, oh, you could have your personal tour guide. So it could know your language, it could know what you're interested in, you could re, re, uh, reorient it to what you wanted to see. So that's one domain we looked at. The other thing we took a step back was to say, okay, we have this interface where you might interact using gesture and a projected UI. How might you also interact with this using other ways of communicating with the drone? So we wanted to find out what would people think to do? So we used a Wizard of Oz study um, and using a technique that uh, Mary Ringel Morris at, um, 
at Microsoft and Jake Wobrock have um, popularized uh, what we would call a gesture elicitation study. We ask people to do um, something like 20 different activities and then we um, said, you communicate with the drone however you think you should. So we didn't say talk to it or gesture or use a prop. We just say however you might control it. And then we controlled the drone and wanted to see what they would do. So in this study, I'm going to turn off the sound. Oh, maybe. So here are the people out behind our building doing this study. And we found a lot of gestures were in common. So for example, stop. I should have had the sound there. Everyone says stop um, and holds up their hand. Um, this is like take a selfie. That was a surprise. Everyone did this thing. We didn't know that would be it. This guy's like, So this guy's like conducting. He's, he said, here, boy. Oh, uh, here, here, boy. And he touched it. He said, take a picture of that palm tree, please. He speaks the drum. So this actually, um, this, you know, this work in publishing you become 2015, Jane E. and Jessica Koshard, who is my postdoc, led it. This, you know, really confirmed results we've seen with mobile robots. People treat them like animals or uh, people, but people do this with these flying, flying devices too, which we weren't sure if that would happen. We wanted to see whether it was culturally dependent. So uh, the year later, we ran this, uh, see if that was Kai 2017, summer of 2016 in uh, Shanghai, we tried to find a similar space um, and see how is it different culturally. So we found certain gestures were really uh, similar. For example, come closer to me, um, take the selfie was the same one, but then other ones were very culturally dependent and different. So for example, stop, um, we saw this in the US, um, but in China, this is what we see. So this is a common East Asian symbol. It's kind of like we would say, time out um, is stop, right? Um, so that's what folks did. We also saw more multi, a slightly more multimodal. There was a lot of multimodal in the US using both gesture and voice, but in China, more multimodal. And then also, um, this is more qualitative than quantitative. Uh, we noticed that when they did gesture, the folks in China use more of their body. So like if you were to say go down in the US, maybe you'd go like this. In China, people would, like they would get down with it. So it was more expressive with the whole body. Um, we thought there would be less of the treating it like an animal or a person due to kind of cultural differences where we would think the drone would be in the out group rather than the in group. But we actually found people did um, treat the drone. Um, like see how she refers to it. When she's saying you, she's talking to the drone like it's a person. You would want to fly higher um, is how she speaks to it. So those were the studies of figuring out what people might do. This was three summers ago, students trying to actually now build the real projected interface. So this is now real, no, no after effects, real wind um, blowing this thing around. Um, <laughs> So I'll just, I'll narrate it here. So a real drone flying outside Gates Hall at Stanford. Um, and so we have vision system. You're seeing here her arm, her head. You see it's moving around a little with the um, wind. As she holds her hand over a menu item, she selects it. If she wants to go back down a hierarchical menu, she gets that little bump up there in the top right. And so what is on the drone? So we have, um, depth camera here, it's just a um, you know, 3D camera that was used for an iPad and then a small projector and then iPod touch rather than an iPhone just because it weighs you know, 80 grams less or something like this. Mm -hmm. And so here you see the depth camera, the structure sensor, and then we process that and we can then move that gesture, move the menu around, hold your hand to select 
So we did it in the lab first, just because you the batteries run out on this stuff and dealing with the wind, just to see if people could do these tasks. So one of the tasks was going through three levels of menu hierarchy. So it would say like A, 5, G, and they would go A, and then the next menu, 5, and G. Um, he's calibrating it here. The next one was more of a um, um, icon task. So this is the three levels of hierarchy he's doing here. Here he had to find a particular icon and navigate to it. And the last one was more of an information seeking task. You know, find the nearest food or find the bathroom. And so you had to interpret what the icons meant without us telling you. So it was more like a realistic walk up and use of the actual device. And so we found, you know, people could do the tasks um, varying on the amount of time. Mainly that one's three levels of hierarchy versus one. And then we did it outdoor with uh, six or seven people. And you can see here, it is an aerobic interface because we didn't work on the computer vision to make these things track better. The drones, since we did this, have gotten much better on their own in terms of the flying um, automatically. And so you can see we did the first and third tasks. We didn't do, repeat the second one because we didn't think it offered much new info. And again, they were able to complete them. The correct rates go slightly down and the time goes up by about a third, um, uh, mainly due to it moving around outside. People really liked it. They found it fun, but you know, it could be novelty effects here. Um, now putting it together, uh, two summers ago, we want to see, could we actually make a tour guide? So I apologize about the quality of this video. This is me running around with my iPhone going, we better capture this. <laughs> um, I didn't think it would be the final video. We've never taped it again. And essentially what you see there is an arrow pointing at the building on Stanford's engineering quad. So there's four buildings and we had a group of people walk up the quad and then walk back. And it's telling them about the building that the arrow is pointing to as they walk up. And then if they raise their hand, it will bring up a menu like you saw in that task where they can ask for more information about that building or where the food or bathrooms are. So you'll just, it's gonna look a little random here, but just to give you an idea of what's going on. And it's loud. So she brought up a map of food or something like that. You know, some tracking issues. And there it's telling her more about that building. Yeah, I'm gonna run out of battery. So then she resumed and now it's telling her about that building and she's walking up. So that was just showing we could put it together. Another thing we've done with drones more recently is could we use drones for haptics in VR? And when the student Parastu Abatai told me about this, I was like, you're crazy, you're gonna get killed, your hands are gonna get cut, uh, you're gonna be wearing goggles. She said, no, we'll first make a safe to touch drone. Um, and she did that first, and then she actually replicated that prior study about gesture elicitation, which we published at UBCOMP, to show that if the drone is safe, guess what? A lot of the gestures become touch gestures. People will touch it if they think it's safe. People touch it even when it's not safe, but a lot more when it's safe. And then she's been working the last six months on this. Literally, I downloaded a video 10 seconds before I came in this room that she's trying to get off today for the WIST deadline at five o'clock. So you are seeing like the latest research maybe that you've ever seen in a talk. So here she has three main tasks. You're in a virtual shopping situation. You could, for example, I wanna feel that dress. Could you actually feel what the material is? So we have different material taped onto the outside of the drone cage and depending on which dress or item you're touching, the drone will spin around and you'll feel a different material. In the second case, we have if you had picked something off a rack, could you feel the weight of like something on an actual uh, clothes hook? And then the last case we, is a passive situation where we turn the drone off and you pick up the cage and put it in a box, you're feeling the weight of an object. So. I actually haven't seen this video. I just downloaded it, so we'll see. Um, she told me though, turn off the sound. She said she has not edited the sound. So you can see this is her parastu. What she sees is in the upper left. And so we do some prediction on where we think she's gonna touch and then show um, where you can touch there and we can move that around 
um, depending on where their hand's going. So that was touching the fabric. In this case, she's gonna do the next task where she's gonna pick something off the rack. I predict, since I haven't seen the video. Oh no, she's touching a different, different item. So she touched two different dresses and felt the different materials. Okay, now I think she'll probably pick it off. She decides she wanted to buy the first one, the scarf. She, she picks it up and now she feels it feels the weight of it doesn't trip on the wire again <laughs> again we're tracking all this using motion tracking cameras you you know it's not practical in the short term but longer term it'll be better tracking usually we play this 10 20 year head game um, and in this case she's going to pick up a shoe box and put it in her virtual shopping bag so we'll see what happens here so it's going to land somewhere. I haven't seen. She's still editing this video. Don't know what we're waiting for. <laughs> and that's all automatic. Nobody's flying that thing. Um, OK, so, she, so it's off, but she feels the weight of a box that she's picking up in this case and putting into a virtual box. So that's that idea. This one's a little more fun. This was a visitor from Sony, and he wanted to play with how can we use drones as a way to augment dance? So this one, I actually do need sound. And so in this case, we have the drone uh, reacting to dance. So this was just accepted to this 2018 as a short paper. Uh, he Sung Kim did this. So we have a hip hop dancer. She has these two uh, microphone sensors essentially on her uh, ankles. And he was motivated by Godzilla movies and the stomping, making everything move. Um, so as she dances, the drones, and the shaking of the film is nothing we did. That literally, it's the drones moving, but also the floor of her just stomping moved the camera a little bit across this dance studio. So there are four drones, and she does one leg, it almost comes out in a wave across them. And so part of this was designing how do you how do you choreograph this? How do you work with the dancer to find this? Um, we were motivated uh, from C Celine Lavalupe's work on uh, augmenting dance at UNC Charlotte. So that was just kind of fun. Could we, you know, have a drone that was reacting to a person who's dancing? called the Aeroquake. And then the latest other one that's just off the presses, I haven't seen this video, I just downloaded it, and he's not gonna submit this to WIST today. Um, um, it's kind of interesting, Jackie Yang is saying, hey, could you, this is a little crazy, but I've done it, write a segue in the real world and be writing it in the virtual world, but in the virtual world you can turn, but in the real world we're just gonna keep you going in a circle so we can do it in a limited space. And we're going to be able to accelerate four to five times faster in the virtual world than you are in the real world. So you'll be able to travel further. The key is, how do you do this without making people sick? We're still working on getting that right. So here you'll see Jackie playing some video game. He's written a driver so you can play any VR game on this thing. And he's actually, you can see he's turning left and right here in the virtual world. But you see him there in the real world. He's just going in a circle. Um, and I guess he has a controller because he's sh some shooting, shooting game, <laughs> right? Infinite bullets, not really realistic, but. So that we're playing with, can we kind of use these illusions in virtual reality um, to allow people to navigate further and not get sick? Because getting sick in these virtual worlds, if you navigate fast, um, is a big problem. So that's one we're working on. Those are some of the other questions for drones. And then before we just finish up, I'm gonna just tell you about the last project without a lot of research, yeah. And I'm sorry to jump in, but we do have a second talk. We okay. We're at noon. Oh, at noon. I just wanna give an opportunity for anybody who is planning to go to that talk to just slip out now. Okay. And then you're, you're welcome to wrap That's up. great. To That's great, thank you. So I was just gonna say, the last project we're doing is a reaction to Buildings. So the fact that people are stressed out, distracted, wasteful, 
unhappy, isolated, you spend 87% of your time in the built environment, but we don't build buildings to, to have a positive impact on you in those ways, but we know buildings impact you. So we know that we could shape buildings because um, they're going to shape us, like Churchill said. So we know daylighting leads to increased productivity. We know greenery improves mood. We know it improves uh, recovery in hospitals. We know reducing noise reduces stress. Um, so how can we make buildings be more dynamic and actually shape people's wellness? And so, for example, here's a another one of these vision videos that we created, um, but I'm not going to show it in the um, um, use of time here, but I'll just say buildings of the future, I think, are going to be this hybrid between the physical and the digital. And we're already seeing that a lot for sensing for energy and security, but how can we use that sensing to actually improve people's wellness? So we know we're going to have all these screens, whether it's in a you know, room like this, but just whether it's in your office on the wall or uh, along the corridor, how can we use those displays, for example, to kind of change people's behavior? So there's a sense of sensing and then actuation, whether it's auditory, visual, temperature, or other things. And so we want to infer people's human state and then actuate it to shape behavior. This has worked with psychologists as well as civil engineers. So imagine a classroom that changes depending on the activity. Maybe the classroom characteristics are different for art versus what they're doing when they're doing math or detecting stress in a worker and having the space automatically help de-stress that worker in terms of light and sound or digital art that can imagine like UV fit or UV green that's you know shared that encourages different behavior. Maybe my team fish is you know, swimming slower, so we know we really should take a walking meeting. So how do we make these buildings more dynamic to help shape our wellness? And how do you do that in a non-creepy uh, paperclip manner, as we say, such that people would actually want to do it? So that's the last brand new project where I don't have any uh, research results yet, but that's what I'm kind of excited about. So sorry to go so long, but thank you for your patience. And I'm glad to take questions of anyone who doesn't have to go. So thanks. Yeah. So in terms of like the, the off-body uh, interfaces that are on most of these seem to be on the floor, what's going to happen while you know all of us here have our off-body interfaces in terms of those in off-body interfaces interacting? Yeah, I mean, obviously if everyone has their little drone, and I imagine in the future your drone's not this big thing, it's like a hummingbird and it's really quiet and the battery lasts forever, because hey, that's going to happen in 20 years. Um, what, how do we make, you know, multi-input things? Didn't you work on that before? Uh, so, so um, you know, we're going to have to figure out how those um, coexist and, and what happens when there's a ton of them becomes an air traffic control question. I don't know whether that future is going to happen, right? It's one possible future. And it could be we use them when we want to collaborate. Instead of having these screens, you and I are, like, doing some idea and the drone just comes in and starts capturing and projecting for us and bringing up information and then it goes away. Um, so I don't really know um, what the collaborative situation is for that. So, good question. I think it's, it's almost more the privacy question. Well, there's the, the privacy. The collaboration is, is easier to see than the collaboration. Yeah. Because yeah. I've never thought of the floor as, as going to have a screen real estate problem. Yeah. I mean, people have done some projected floor UIs, but they're generally in fixed spaces where we have a projector up in the corner and it doesn't really go anywhere or in museum situations. I mean, I imagine that thing like the tour guide or I'm in Grand Central Station or actually one of these train stations in China, they're huge and I'm like, I don't know where to go and like this, where's the bathroom? And the drone could like kind of bring me there almost like an attendant. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it could be in these crowded public spaces and sometimes it may be outdoors and sometimes it could be when they're quiet and stuff in the building space mm -hmm. like this. Um, and yeah, privacy is an issue in any kind of projected display if it's not, you know, on my hand or something like that. Now, whether I can track your hand well enough to do that, I think eventually, um, not yet. Any other questions? Yeah. I wonder how you think about augmented reality, not virtually, or projected reality, because um, what you have in front of you the that so that is augmented reality. Um, using glass, sorry. Oh, using glass. Using glass. Yeah. For example, the first one with the ambient like signal yeah. of the physics that can be really delivered using 
doesn't really do yeah. in a more personal manner, where there's a real pull of air, like yeah. he's sinking and drowning. So I think augmented reality with glasses doesn't make sense until those glasses are as comfortable as sunglasses or your normal glasses. And if you're like me, trying not to wear glasses, but maybe I will have to any day now, um, you know, then I might do it. But as long as it's like this bulky thing that's on my face, I, I don't want that thing on my face. That, Is your that, projection yeah. Than yeah, I think augmented reality is gonna be huge, you know, way bigger than virtual reality, and I think many HCI people agree with that. When the device is, uh, you know, the battery lasts long enough and it's small enough, and we're seeing some of that. I don't know if you've seen the new Intel ones in the last three months, they have some that, like, you look at it and you're like, really, is that really? And they do simpler AR so that they could reduce the size of it. Um, but I think, yeah, we'll have glasses for sure. Um, this is just a different form factor for a different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a whole bunch more concept videos that I didn't show because it's really become a technique for my group. Um, it's one of the cases where I actually followed my teach, my research followed my teaching versus the other way around. I've had students in my intro HCI class do concept videos probably for almost 10 years now, and they do it before they actually have a UI design. So they do their need finding and have the idea, and then I say, create a concept video. And the concept video, I tell them, I don't want to see the device in your video or at least not the interface. So many of them are mobile phone and you'll see the person with the mobile phone, but I don't see the interface. I'm seeing the situation and how it's gonna fit into their life. And if we need to see some information just to be able to know what's going on, we might use motion graphics on top of the screen, but they're abstracted and you kind of know, oh, that's not exactly what I'd see on the screen. So we've done that for 10 years. So I started doing it in research. Um, you know, the research ones tend to be a little more high fidelity with that drone one being on the extreme because Luke's a professional designer and he could spend two months and really get shadows in there. Um, um, but normally, like this one, I didn't show you the building. I had undergrads do it in four weeks. Um, most of them are more of that quality. Um, and so we use it both as a design technique for ourselves. I think creating the video itself is half the value of kind of thinking through the ideas because you have to make it that more concrete. And then um, we show it to people, but not as like a, a um, not like in a, a usability situation where we would take in a group of people and say, hey, what do you think about the video? It's more like in situations like this where I might give a talk and then talk to other people and get feedback on what they thought about the video. You know, show it in a lot of different situations like that, but not in a, a focus group or more of a formalized situation. I haven't thought about whether I would kind of take it to that level. Um, to do that. You could. Any other questions? Yeah, Joanna. So, doing a lot of drone work in the recent years, yeah. um, where do you think, is, is it implied in this that you really think drones are going to kind of fully take off? <laughs> or, I don't know, it's yeah. not a very well-worded question. No, no, that's actually a really good question. So. Drones, I think, are going to really take off. If you've seen how uh, much the sales of them and uh, how improved they are. I have one other drone thing with photography, with um, how to help cinematographers do it without having to be pilots that Jane is working on right now, Jane E. Um, I, so I've only done drones for, I don't know, three or four years. It's like a side gig. I'm almost done. Um, because the problem with drones for me is I want all my research really to hit three major themes. And my other talk really talks about that, which is um, problems that I think are world problems. So for me, it's the environment, health, and education. So almost all of my projects fall into those three areas, except for the drones. And the drones were kind of just started by that one, hey, let's do this thing. And 
we've come up with some other ideas for them, but like, I don't have long-term motivation to do drones unless I can find a good spot in those domains. And I don't actually have one. There's some like search and rescue and, you know, we'll give you some health delivery, but you know, people have done it. So I, for me, unless I get a really good idea in one of those important social impact domains, I'm likely not to do more drones. But that's more just from my research preference. I think from a commercial impact, they are going to happen in a big way and we will see them in a lot more pieces of our lives. And there will be pushback on privacy, noise, um, surveillance and some other things. And yeah, and I, and I think it will be interesting to see where where do they end up, how calm and how much. Um, but I think they're going to happen um, um, anyways. But I'm probably not going to be part of that because it doesn't fit my research interests. Yeah, I mean, we've obviously seen entertainment ones yeah. like that. I, I think that, you know, the, the single drug yeah. seems kind of clunky, you know, right now. But it's yeah. the same kind of clunkiness as, well, these glasses aren't exactly... Yeah. I definitely, do, I definitely do believe with what I know about happening in battery technology and other stuff that we will see very small, capable drones that can lift a decent payload so that you could do things like this projection and other stuff in the 10 to 20 year time frame, it's just a question of which end is it. Um, it will happen. That, that, that assumes that they will actually have a payload, right? That if you don't want payload, payload, you already have nano drones. Right. Yeah, if you want something, just flies. Rather than something yeah. that is pieced together yep. from multiple bits of technology. Yep, if you want just simple sensing stuff, these nano drones already exist. They're tiny, they're quiet. Um, but I think we're going to have more capable drones. This is why I like to say, I think the hummingbird like drone is, you know, the 10 to 20 year thing that is quiet and can actually carry something and do something and will come and go as I need it. It won't just be following me all the time. I mean, go away, maybe go to charge, whatever. But when I need it, it comes, helps me in whatever way and then takes off again. I think that vision will happen, but probably 10 or 20 years and it's batteries is the big thing we're waiting for, but there's big battery breakthroughs that are happening, but batteries take five or 10 years. So I think um, I, I can take further questions. In the room. Yeah, let's let you go. Yeah. So thanks yeah. again Thank to you. James for the wonderful talk. And I, I, are there people in the room who are hoping